Good morning. Uh, so my name is Bridget Heward. I am with Innovation Factory. Uh, today's session, uh, we are welcoming uh, one of our partners, Ready, Willing and Able. Uh, and so this session is in partnership with them and it is the Ontario Reopening, the Competitive Advantage of Inclusion with Ready, Willing and Able. Um, so we are expecting a small group today. However, I will um, go through uh, some Zoom etiquette in a moment. Uh, just to give you a sense of um, how to navigate this session. So at the start, you've been muted upon entering and your camera is not enabled. Uh, we will use the Q&A uh, feature um, to type in your questions to the speakers. You can upvote questions from other attendees using this function. Um, and questions in the Q&A can be asked on your behalf by myself, or uh, alternatively, I will give everyone uh, the ability to, uh, to speak by unmuting your mics, and you can raise your hand uh, to get my attention to ask questions. About Innovation Factory, we are a regional innovation center. Uh, there are about 18 of us in the province. Uh, we're located in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, within McMaster Innovation Park, and we've been there since 2011. A little bit about what we do. Uh, so as a regional innovation center, we're not for profit. Uh, so we never take any equity in any businesses that we work with. And our sole purpose uh, is to, in existence is to uh, help uh, entrepreneurs and startups scale their businesses. We are mandated uh, by, by um, you know, our mandate is to service uh, specific tech sectors. So we work with information technology companies, advanced manufacturing, clean tech, life science, integrated mobility as it relates to autonomous vehicles through our CITM initiative, which is under the Greater Avon project through in the province. Uh, and lastly, social innovation as well. Um, now, if you don't find yourself itemized in the sectors below, we do share our sessions with the community to encourage um, community members to innovate, uh, to encourage entrepreneurs to consider innovation in their businesses uh, and those working in innovation obviously um, uh, to, to, to uh, push the envelope a little farther. Um, so uh, that's what we do. And uh, how we can help is we, we, we are uh, great with market intelligence. We can get you access to that. Uh, strategic connections, pitch and networking nights. We've got Lions Lair coming up at the end of the month uh, there, which should be an amazing bracket style tournament, all virtual this year. Uh, we have training and workshops such as this one. Uh, and th this uh, session is being recorded and will be on our resource page on our website, as well as shared through newsletters and on requests. So, uh, we, we hope to create a great asset uh, that will have um, long lasting value for our clients. Uh, and we also help with business advisory services and much, much more. So uh, get in touch with us if you have questions, we'd love to help. Um, our speakers, so uh, our speakers for today, we have Siobhan Costello, Jackie Moore, and Maggie Stewart. They're all uh, labor market consultants with Ready, Willing, and Able, and they're lovely, and they've been lovely to chat with these last few months and getting this organized. So I hope you will check out this organization uh, and all the wonderful services that they can assist with, which they'll discuss in length in the presentation today. Okay, a few things coming up um, to keep an eye on. We have an events calendar and not only do we post our own events, we post partner events as well as community events whenever they align with uh, what our clients are looking for. So uh, coming up, we have our Venture Accelerator Partners uh, Sales Bootcamp, which is a client exclusive. Um, that's four sessions that's starting next week. Uh, should be a great one. That one uh, is highly attended and, and, and uh, well regarded. So please check it out. Uh, we also have Realize success through Young Talent with BioTalent Canada on September 16th. Uh, we have a great castle refresher uh, for all of those e-commerce and marketing folks um, and where to draw the castle line when reaching out to customers and, and, and regard, in regards to their rights and privacy. So given everything's moved virtual, that's even more relevant today than it was six months ago. So please, uh, you need the refresher, check that session out on September 17th. And finally, on September 18th, uh, rest and Par will be joining us for an intellectual property uh, basics for startup session um, and they're also a long-standing partner so we're looking forward to that 
And uh, just on uh, speaking of partners, just a quick thank you to all of our ecosystem partners. We really couldn't do what we do without the support of those in our community um, who, who, who lend their support through services, through uh, referrals. Um, so thank you to all of our partners. And if you're interested in partnering with us, uh, you can always contact us and find out um, what kind of opportunities we offer. Okay, and on that, on that note, this is my last slide. Uh, so if you wanna stay connected with us, um, we are really active on Twitter and LinkedIn specifically, uh, and we have a newsletter that goes out weekly that gives you all the updates, the funding, sessions, you name it. Um, and uh, we're also on Facebook, not as active there. So I'd check out Twitter and LinkedIn instead uh, and just to see what else we've got going on. And um, on that note, thank you for listening. I will stop sharing my screen and ask Siobhan Costello to come on and share hers. Okay, there she is. There we are. Hey, so just remember to unmute yourselves and there we go. We've got the screen. You're good. So I'll shut myself off and off you go, Siobhan. Perfect. So thank you so much, Bridget. Uh, yeah, thank you to Innovation Factory and everyone joining us today. Um, yeah, so we are, everybody was able, we are the Ontario team. And today our uh, webinar is about the Ontario reopening, the competitive advantage of inclusion. So how your business can harness um, neurodiverse talent and help your business grow. Okay, this would be helpful, there you go. Um, so who we are, so Ready, Willing, and Able, we are a national initiative of the Canadian Association for Community Living, as well as the Canadian Autism Spectrum Disorder Alliance. Um, so those are our two founding members. So we are across Canada. We support companies in hiring people with um, intellectual disabilities, as well as those on the autism spectrum. Uh, and so the three of us here today are located in Toronto, and we are the Ontario team. Uh, so in our WA, in Ontario, we are delivered by two host organizations, so Community Living Ontario and Carrie's Place Autism Services, reflecting um, the participants in our network. Uh, so who are we? Um, so we are, um, as Siobhan mentioned, an inclusive employment initiative. Very unique about our initiative is that we are created and we work to support employers and whatever employers may need to hire inclusive of job seekers who self-identify as having either an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. Our goal is to promote a labor market with an employment rate for persons with an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder on par with the national average. So how we do that, um, we have kind of uh, three main things that you see on your screen there that we, that we do that support employers through. So uh, connecting and supporting employers um, to connect with the community uh, with a greatly untapped labor market. Uh, promote, we promote awareness among employers and the general public on the benefits of hiring inclusively. So that's greatly what we're doing today. That's a big piece of what we do, um, either just Kind of having webinars like this, uh, introducing people to what it is that we do. And then we also offer some training sessions as well and some more in-depth support in order to ensure that employers are creating a very inclusive and diverse workplace. Um, on to the next one, Siobhan. So Ready, Willing, and Able, we've been around since 2014. Um, and in this time, we've hit some pretty uh, fantastic uh, targets including we have connected with over 10,000 businesses in Canada. We are a national initiative. The three of us are the Ontario representatives, but we do have staff in each province and territory across Canada, uh, which is awesome. We're super proud to be a truly national initiative. Um, so we've supported TV businesses in hiring over 2,500 individuals who have an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. Uh, we work with eight national employers, and three of them have been recognized as the best diversity employers. Uh, we'll show you a little bit later the national employers that we do work with. Uh, we also received an award from the Zero Project at the United Nations in Vienna in 2017. So uh, we have seen um, some pretty fantastic results of our work. 
Uh, so these are the national employers that we work with. Um, so we work with them right across Canada um, and hiring in various, uh, various areas of their business. Um, so we do work with some retail organizations. We work with uh, food services. We work with Deloitte, so in I, IT and professional services as well. But even looking at some of those employers there too, like PepsiCo, for example, we work with them with logistics um, as well as um, warehousing. So logistics as far as um, like organizing inventory and things such as that. Um, so we're super proud to be working on a national scale with all of these um, with all of these fantastic companies and we'd love to work with you as well. I think I went too fast. And something to note as well, um, to add on to the, the national partners that we do have, we also have um, partnerships with lots of local businesses as well. So we work with a lot of smaller scale companies um, that we'll highlight some stories later on in our presentation. Um, that you know they they just they they don't have the national reach but we work with sort of employers in all sectors and of all scales um so this slide is just showing a bit of a challenge that exists right now around um absenteeism and the turnover um the, the challenges for employers so canadian businesses face a shrinking labor pool and increasingly competitive business market um, high turnover and absenteeism are costly realities resulting in a need for ongoing recruitment and to the left of that point is sort of the the cost that it has an impact on our on our economy um, and and there's there's data around the cost of turning over an employee can range at, for one employee can range anywhere between three to five thousand dollars per employee which is a significant cost to an employer um, and there's outdated incorrect perceptions tend to focus on someone's disability rather than ability. And something to think about, you know, I kind of reflect on my experience in, in the field and supporting people on the autism spectrum. And we do all this awareness, we all do all this training and how to teach them to socialize and interact appropriately in, in different environments. And all of that work is really valuable and really good, but we also need to do work in the environment stage where, um, you know, we're, we're uh, in, in the community where we're learning about what kind of social communication deficits exist for this population and then we can also be doing some work and adapting our environments to make it a little bit easier for people to integrate into these environments. Um, so to those issues, um, RWA very much stands behind the idea that inclusive hiring is the solution to these issues and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and when we talk about our business case and some of the research around how it benefits your business. And as well as on, on the theme of, of today's webinar as well, uh, very much so as well, a solution to labor market. Um, I don't want to say issues, but labor solutions to your, your labor market needs following uh, and within the pandemic. Of COVID so as well as kind of all of those services, we also want to help uh, employers to create an inclusive workplace. Um, so kind of offering more diversity and inclusion awareness training. Um, so the first step in kind of including uh, creating an inclusive workplace is just to build awareness and understanding. So to have a welcoming team, to have people who are um, educated in autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disabilities who understand the appropriate supports needed to be put in place. So taking a flexible, creative approach to bringing on new employees, to training, interviewing, um, and really taking that individualized approach to support someone with a disability. Um, so these are just kind of some initial steps. Um, so then when we talk about disability, um, what's really important is what we understand disability is that it's not an inherent deficit in the person. So it's not that they were, um, you know, they have something wrong with them, but it's the way that people with, um, who are labeled with having disabilities interact with the world. So someone who uses um, a, a wheelchair in an ideally completely accessible environment might not perceive themselves to have um, a disability if it was a truly accessible world. So our definition is to really understand that the way society is kind of structured has that mismatch with the characteristics of people that we represent. So just kind of taking a more um, universal approach to disability and to know that it is universal, it affects people all over the world, and that 
everyone will go through changes in their abilities throughout their lifespan as we age. So kind of understanding that disability is not this unique kind of, you know, um, tricky thing that we have to figure out, but it really does kind of affect everyone in the workplace. And we can just really put in some good, excuse me, tools to help you um, adapt. So then uh, diversity versus inclusion. So what is diversity versus inclusion? So um, diversity is more of a fact. So it's your gender, your ethnicity, your age, your education, um, physical characteristics. And then inclusion is ways that you put procedures in place to make people with um, diverse backgrounds to truly be all part of the same team. So a nice kind of little way of saying that is diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And, and as well, too, when, when we uh, talk about disability as well, um, our, our initiative is focused on individuals self-identify as having either an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. But greatly, the, the tools and the support that we offer to employers is across disability and also across different equity groups as well, which is something to keep in mind as well, that while our focus is, um, is rather deep and specific, um, what we are talking about does have a more broad, uh, broad application as well. Um, so when talking about our initiative, how we work, um, so we create demands. So that, that is, um, encompasses a lot of different things in working with employers. So we are employer focused. We are focused on existing employment needs within an organization as well. So we want to work with you within, um, with hiring needs that you have within your business. Um, and we work um, with a variety of different things along, along um, those lines as well to, to support the employer, support you to feel confident uh, in creating a diverse workplace as well. Um, so once that demand has been created, once you've shared a job with us uh, that's uh, already existing within the organization, we connect that demand to agencies. So we work with a, a broad network of uh, employment across Ontario. Uh, we work with uh, over 30 in the greater Toronto area, and then across Ontario, we work with over 60 organizations. So what's really awesome about working with Ready, Willing, and Able is that you have access to a really broad talent pool of very qualified um, applicants, greatly untapped labor market as well. And you can always go through Ready, Willing, and Able as a single point of contact to get access to candidates from all different organizations, uh, but you always get with us with Ready, Willing, and Able in order to access applicants. Um, so after that connection process, we facilitate the hiring process. So we support with interviews, accommodations, onboarding, all of those things as well. Um, and then kind of um, we, we provide support on an ongoing basis. So it's not just you have you get support from us once someone's hired, once they're in the job, we, we back off. We provide support on an ongoing basis for the duration of the employment of the individual, um, which is really good as well. Um, so just to add a little bit more to what Jackie was saying, and something I don't know if we've mentioned yet, but this is often a question that we get asked from employers um, is, is around cost, because it sounds like we offer so much um, but we're fully funded by the federal government. So everything we do is free. There are no costs associated to working with us. And um, so we're, we're keen on, on, on making new partnerships with lots of different businesses. Um, you know, we don't, we don't set targets. We don't have contracts. Um, we just want to work with businesses who are open to giving it a try with us. So, um, so just to go into a little bit more detail around the, the type of supports that we offer uh, businesses um, around pre-hire supports. This can look different depending on what your business is and what your needs are. Um, but this could be anything from doing the, um, you know, an, analyzing what a job description and making it sort of inclusive to people in our network. So before COVID, we would typically like to go into a workplace and do a bit of a tour, learn a little bit more uh, specifics around what the role is and what it entails. Um, job descriptions tend to be a little bit jargony. Um, so we try to use really clear language as to what is expected of the person. Um, and then we may also add in things like 
some like environmental factors. Is it is it loud? Um, is it an open working environment where they're sharing space and it might be a little bit distracting? Um, is there, you know, what is, is, is there a weird smell depending on the environment, right? So we might add in things that you wouldn't traditionally put in a job description just so we can make sure we're pulling candidates that would fit in that environment. Um, you know, we, as, as we've mentioned, we do a lot of education and training. This is a huge part of what we offer and it's a really important part of what we do. Um, as I said before, having, you know, when, when people on the spectrum, kids moving into adolescence, into adults, they're, we're always pushing to teach them these skills to fit into our society. And, and, and I think that we need to kind of do some more work on our end and meet them in the middle uh, and do work uh, to sort of make the environment and the community more understanding and accepting of, of these folks so that, so that they can su succeed in, in, in a working environment. So the education and training part is key. And, and that can really look like anything, like we've offered lunch and learns, um, we've been invited to team meetings. Um, you know, sometimes people only have time to give us a quick 20 minutes and we'll condense everything and do a quick 20 minutes. If you want us to do a three hour training, you know, half day thing, we can do that. Like we, we are very flexible and, and able to sort of customize um, what we do to fit your need and your business. Um, and then again, like Jackie mentioned, we, we offer support in the recruitment process. So an example of that is like, we would find out what your process is. A lot of uh, companies are learning or are sorry, using um, online applications now, which can sometimes pose as a bit of a barrier for, for our clients, sometimes not. Um, so we kind of try to find out the details around your recruitment process. Um, an example that came out recently was I was working with an employer who, um, when we, we provided the, the applications to them, what they do is um, they do a pre-screen phone call. And then if the person passes the pre-screen phone call, then they're in, invited in for an interview. And, um, and I, so I coached them around this pre-screen phone call and encouraged them to um, either schedule it because uh, somebody on the spectrum or with an intellectual disability may uh, struggle in receiving sort of an unexpected phone call uh, and may struggle even just communicating over the phone in general. So finding another way to, to do that stage of your recruitment, um, to potentially schedule the phone call or to, to send them the questions over email and allow them to reply um, over email is, is a quick, easy accommodation that can be put in place, which removes a barrier for our folks and, and allows a more inclusive pathway to have them considered for the job. And then the onboarding and retention piece um, is really important. So Ready, Willing, and Able has funding available for um, our candidates in, in making sure that they're successful in retaining uh, employment. So the most commonly requested um, uh, accommodation for somebody is to allow them to have somebody like a job coach come in. And that's just really a support person who specializes in employment and that person will, they're not there to do their job for them, but they're there to just help them navigate um, the onboarding and the training and learn the new roles um, and make sure that they're comfortable. And then that support is gradually faded out over time. And that kind of support is something that we provide the funding for. So it's not a, an extra cost to the employer at all. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, so like Maggie said, obviously, uh, or all of these are um, services that we are able to provide. And even with the education and training, if you have existing employees with disabilities, um, the training that we have is able to kind of be used for um, other equity seeking groups and just other people with disabilities as well, and just to help employers kind of get a better sense of the employees that they're working with. So we really want our resources to kind of be used as broadly as possible. So our so this is um, our get the facts page. So um, within our, the last uh, five years of being in operation, we were surveyed by um, uh, the University of British Columbia, who connected employer surveys with the employers in our network, who hired with us over the past five years. And these were some of the um, statistics that came out of that report. Um, so just kind of quickly glancing at it. So um, compared to their colleagues. 94% of uh, people hired through RWA rated better than average on punctuality, 
and then 95% were um, rated better than average on attendance and use of sick days. So just kind of showing that if someone has, finds the right fit for them, they are motivated, they are excited to come to work, they don't miss days, they show up earlier than perhaps they should, you know, they're regularly late. So really to show that um, kind of the misconception that, you know, people with disabilities don't want to work, or, um, which is the exact opposite kind of status um, that we're finding. Um, yeah, so on the other ones there are contributing to a positive workplace morale, your attitude toward work and getting along with customers and clients. So businesses rated employees um, higher than RWA as well as or better than average as their peers on those issues down below. Some other facts that are here is that 97% um, of businesses rated employees hired for RWA um, better than average on turnover. So like Maggie was saying earlier, the cost to um, hire, to interview, to train, to onboard a new employee and then to have them realize that it's not the right fit and then they leave and you start that process all over again. That is quite costly. So if an RWA employee, what we found is that when they find the right fit, they stay. They're very accepted to that job and that is just good for everyone's business. And and these stats as well, were, uh, as Siobhan mentioned, we're, we're super proud they are from employers that have worked with us across Canada. Um, really have seen um, right, right here in Canada the benefit of hiring inclusively. And when we're thinking as well as, a, as a wanting a competitive advantage, wanting to be innovative um, in the context of today in, in 2020, um, hiring diversity, this is how you achieve that competitive advantage. That, that is an innovative approach. Um, so, uh, yeah, just really encourage you to, to uh, we also have these stats on our website as well, so you can get the content um, to really take a look at this and, and, and kind of see a way to, to, to think about um, inclusion and diversity as an thing that isn't just the right thing to do, but it's something that drives innovation and drives your business as well. Yes, that's right. Diverse opinions, the innovated workforce. Um, so this is, so these are just some other statistics, so kind of highlighted from the uh, slide before on our, our employees who have hired, sorry, employers who have hired um, through RWA, kind of rating um, their employees compared to their other neurotypical peers. And overall, we found that there was a 93% um, retention rate. Um, so the talent pool. Uh, so uh, we support employers um, to connect with a greatly untapped labor pool. Um, so individuals self-identify as having an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. Uh, now we, we sometimes are asked by employers why we specify self-identification. Um, it's just because sometimes the process of receiving a formal diagnosis uh, can be can present a barrier itself to individuals. Um, so it's just that the language that we do use um, internally just don't require any of that documentation um, regarding uh, any kind of formal uh, diagnosis or anything like that, just, just um, for your own kind of knowledge as well. Um, Um, so when we talk about the talent pool as well, only one in four people with an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder are employed. So when we talk about a greatly untapped labor market, this is why uh, people with an intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder have the lowest employment rate of all disability types. Um, misconceptions about the abilities of people within this population are the number one barrier so it's not that people are unable to do the job, it's that they are perceived as being able to do the job. And as Maggie was mentioning before as well, greatly ready, willing, and able exists because we realize that these misconceptions exist within the Canadian uh, workforce, uh, within employers. If you really want to work with employers to break down these misconceptions, um, show the statistics like we showed before, have a conversation about how disability is an advantage within your workplace. Um, I'll eat <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah, and, and to add on to that too, besides the misconceptions, like people aren't confident that they'll be able to do the job. And I mean, it's, it's really the opposite. I think the other challenge is that there's so many unintentional barriers that exist. People aren't aware that their recruitment process is not inclusive for, for folks on the spectrum to get through. And I think like even to, to consider, I mean, this is sort of a, a broader issue that's not necessarily in the control of an employer or the recruitment process, but people, there's such a stigma attached to, to having a diagnosis of ASD or an intellectual disability, so people aren't comfortable disclosing. And so what happens um, majority of the time is if folks on the spectrum, if they're applying to jobs just through a regular pathway, um, you know, happen to maybe get invited in for an interview, they sit down at that interview and they may not be looking at the person, uh, may, not, may not be making eye contact, um, they may be sort of talking in a bit of a monotone voice, which may come across as that they don't want to be there or that they're uninterested or unmotivated. And those, those are also um, huge, huge barriers um, because, you know, the interviewer would perceive that as the person, you know, not being a good fit for the job for all of those reasons. Um, but really, the person it just struggles with social communication. And we'll talk a little bit more about the characteristics of autism. Um, the, the, anyway, that that's sort of they'll they'll do the interview, and then the interviewer or the employer will will just say, you know, that that person just isn't interested. They wouldn't be a good fit, and they're not getting their foot in the door because of those things. So, um, so that awareness and training uh, is really important too. So even if you're, you know, hiring just you know your regular hiring practices and not using an organization like Ready, Willing, and Able, and you're interviewing somebody who's who's sort of displaying these behaviors you might have a better understanding of what's going on there and take into consideration that they you know they might have a diagnosis like autism or or you know so, something that sort of goes under the neurodiversity umbrella um, that affects their social communication but doesn't mean that it really will affect the way that they're able to perform in their job um, so just we'll just go through uh, some slides of just sort of a general um, info about like ASD and um, and intellectual disability. So um, these are some common characteristics that um, somebody on the autism spectrum can display, um, and and this is sort of putting a spin on it to to show that it can be seen as a real strength in the workplace. So. Um, you know, they have excellent concentration. And these are sort of, I'm making general generalization terms. This is like, these are common things. This is not speaking to every person on the spectrum. And we'll talk a little bit more about how broad the spectrum is. But um, these are just some, some common characteristics that you may see in somebody on the spectrum. So um, excellent concentration, attention to detail, um, thinking outside the box. Um, many people have an exceptional memory or very unique skills. Like I've, I've met with a a job seeker once who, you know, he didn't greet me. He didn't say, you know, I said, hi, I'm, I'm Maggie. And he didn't say, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so. He just said to me, um, when's your birthday? And I told him my birthday and he told me, you were born on a Tuesday. That was like our first interaction that we had. Um, so he, they have these like very unique, very unique specialized skills, um, which in it, you know, if you find them the right fit for the job where they can really use those skills, I mean, that is where it's like, fireworks go off and it's just like the best scenario. So um, finding those finding those guys that, and, and gals that are on the spectrum that can sort of utilize their specialized skills in, in work is, is, is sort of the best, the best scenario. Um, reliability and honesty, I mean, that's really what our business case speaks to. Um, you know, I think we were giggling about a scenario the other day where um, the only like feedback we were hearing from an employer we were working with was that, um, the person was showing up too early to work. And, um, and you know, if that's the problem that you're having with somebody you've hired through us, and I mean, that's, that's, a good, that's a good problem to have, I think. So, um, you know, they're eager to work, they're excited to work, they're keen, you know, they just have to be given that shot to, to get their foot in the door. And, uh, and, you know, I think in that scenario, um, you know, they were just coached, like, you know, we know you're eager to get there, but you gotta show up, try to show up like 10 minutes early rather than like, you know, an hour early. Um, and, and they often can be hyper-focused. Um, once they are sort of engaged in a task, they have this like hyper-focus where they're able to just like zone in and complete the task to, you know, very precisely. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I can I can do this one too if you want. Okay. Um, social communication characteristics of ASD. I mean, I kind of talked a little bit about this and how it can translate into a barrier for them in terms of gaining meaningful employment. Um, but they have a different different style of communication compared to people without ASD. So communication may be used more for the purposes of information sharing rather than rapport building. So even that example I used where the person didn't engage in a greeting with me, um, you know, that the, the small talk around like how you know the weather and stuff like that, typically people on the spectrum don't don't engage um, in that kind of conversation. Um, they don't, I, I think that it's, it's, it's sort of seen as, as sort of pointless to them. Like, and, and a lot of the communication that they like to engage in is, is more just to the point, give me the information and let's move on. So those sort of, um, that like, uh, what is it? The unwritten social mm -hmm. um, curriculum is sort of not something that is on their radar. Um, Individuals with ASD may interpret colloquial or a figurative language uh, literally. Um, and so we always coach uh, employers on, on avoiding using phrases like that. So like, you know, if somebody walks into an interview, you're not going to say like, it's raining cats and dogs because a lot of people on the spectrum don't, don't understand those, those types of phrases. Yeah, so then this is just kind of a little cartoon to say, you know, where do we, does anyone know where we keep those unwritten rules? So in a, a lunchroom setting, you know, does everyone get their own spot in the fridge? Is the fridge food fair game? Where do we put our coats? Um, you know, just because your door is closed, does that mean they can come in? So just all those little things that maybe you and I might understand as kind of, you know, office norms or things we've observed and seen other people do and just started doing ourselves might just need to be kind of clearly communicated. So this is where your coat goes. Yes, these are the parts of the fridge that is for everyone. This part's not. So yeah, just, don't eat other people's lunches. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even if it looks tasty, right? So just kind of those rules. And I think there was, uh, you know, an example that Maggie, you, you shared where, um, someone was working in a warehouse and they were told to kind of, you know, when you hear the bell, that means your shift's over and, you know, you need to get, get right back to work. So like, you know, rush over there and get right back to work. So I think the person was hearing the bell and was running through the warehouse. They didn't have to actually rush oh, and get <laughs> That there. was when their, when their break was over, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So to kind of like the idea of the literally like you better get there quick. And they were thinking, Oh, well then I have to run. Right. Then. It was just a simple kind of redirection. Oh, we just might, you know. Yes. So and that speaks to, to that, that eagerness and keenness to work, right? And so the, this person was, um, yeah, they, they saw it as a bit of a safety issue running, running through a warehouse to get back to his workstation. So, um, so, you know, and that's where we come in handy, right? And the, the, the employer was like, what do we do? And we're like, oh, we just can like coach him. We can put in some like visuals to remind him to slow down and walk back to his workstation from the break room and you know whatever I don't remember exactly what what we implemented but something very simple and it worked and it was fine so we're always available for that for that kind of mm -hmm. help and support mm -hmm. yeah and greatly too oh, what we just want to enforce as well is is that um yeah not, not assuming that that people know these unwritten rules and understanding as well that um that we're um where some some kinds of misconceptions about people being unable to do a job um, is because of a workplace not understanding the communication style of someone who has become a part of the team. So greatly, it's 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 something that we want um, you to keep in mind um, and and to understand as well. And like like uh, the girls are saying as well, we're here to support with it. Also, I, I had to run and get a headset because I was told that my audio wasn't mm -hmm. there, so that's why I disappeared. But. <laughs> Um, yeah, so these are just kind of some more um, behavioral characteristics. We kind of talked about social um, characteristics, so miscommunications or understandings, taking things literally. Um, but there might be some behavioral characteristics as well. So like, um, like you mentioned, if you just hire someone and they're kind of, you know, you're doing a, or you're interviewing someone um, and, you know, you might see some of these characteristics that could kind of indicate that maybe, you know, some of these tools might be helpful. So um, repetitive movement or speech. So if someone is kind of rocking back and forth or you know, maybe moving a little bit and you might think that they're, you know, fidgeting, they're distracted, they're not paying attention, that that actually can be quite the opposite and that those are um, ways that individual is kind of expressing their anxiety in a way to let them concentrate, so to help them focus. 
Um, so um, perhaps intense interests as well. So someone might want to only talk to you about, you know, certain things or, you know, birthdays or, you know, their favorite s superhero movie. Um, so kind of having a really intense interest. But when that interest is, you know, coding or finding errors in, in code or finding, you know, making sure that, you know, processes line up and those are highly valued skills in the workplace. So kind of taking that interest and just making sure it's, you know, refocusing it at work. Um, general preference for structure as well. So making sure things are, um, I think everyone kind of likes when they know what's coming, right? I think this whole pandemic has shown us that, you know, everyone doesn't like change too much. So as much as you can kind of, you know, plan your routine, you know what's coming the next day, these are the tasks I have to do, just that alone is kind of takes away the anxiety from someone and really helps them to focus and understand what's coming next. So you say like, when I finish this, I move on to the next task. And then lastly, it can be some sensory sensitivities. So when Maggie was mentioning earlier that we come on site and do kind of tours and visits, that's to see, you know, is there a lot of that background noise in an office environment that might be that kind of underlying buzz hum that maybe most people can tolerate, but some other people would find that very, very distracting at work. Or is it a really cold environment? Are there, you know, scents, perfumes, fragrances? So things that can just kind of affect someone at work as well. So just being mindful um, of these issues. And we can definitely kind of help um, put, kind of uh, measures in place to address these if they come up. Oh. Ah, okay. So this is kind of the next couple slides is what the um, generally people I think see when they think autism spectrum, that it's a linear spectrum. So that if someone is kind of where this black dot is here over on the left, this might be where someone would be impacted a little bit by autism. And that people might think that as you move towards the spectrum, you're impacted a little bit more and a little bit more. So this is actually not the case and the spectrum looks more like this. So um, this is where someone's um, characteristics can be impacted by a few different aspects. So maybe they excel in one area um, and maybe they need challenges in a certain other. So these are kind of really more what the spectrum looks like um, and kind of getting to consider the person as a whole and not just like how far on you and your, uh, you know, your development, how, how adaptive are you? How much do you behave like I do? It's more like, like we all do. Maybe I struggle with presenting in front of people, but maybe I'm really great at paying attention to detail. So kind of, you know, like anyone, there's multiple things that impact someone at work or in life. And kind of this is just, we want to um, show that the people we work with are, it's like that as well. You ladies, said anything else you want to add on this? I just want to add that I think you're yeah. excellent at presenting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. <laughs> um, um, so the, the, um, the other uh, population that we work to support uh, or individuals with an intellectual disability. Um, so Shavana and myself, we work uh, directly for Community Living Ontario. Um, the Community Living has a presence in, in, um, in communities right across Canada. So I'm not sure if you've had a connection with Community Living before, but Community Living as a movement supports individuals with an intellectual disability. Um, so when we talk about intellectual disability, um, uh, there are two main things that it does affect. So intellectual functioning as well as adaptive functioning. Um, so this, when we were talking before about how we view disability as well, where it's a mixed match between an individual and the environment, uh, greatly that would apply as well with um, intellectual disabilities also. Um, so intellectual disabilities would involve things uh, or involve disabilities such as uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, Down syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome, um, things like that. And it does um, involve um, the, the um, uh, IQ of an individual as well. If you want to go to the next slide. So um, adaptive functioning characteristics of intellectual disability. Um, so would uh, uh, be conceptual skills, social skills, and practical skills, where um, an individual with an intellectual disability um, may um, may have a, a difference with all three of these things um, from a more neurotypical individual. Yes. So I think we're just going to highlight some of our success stories over the next few slides. Um, mm -hmm. So Desjardins, Desjardins, 
help me pronounce this, Desjardins. Desjardins, <laughs> thank you, Siobhan. Um, hired for cyber city. Um, um, some folks on the spectrum in positions in cyber security and communications and technicians. Oh, you're cutting out for me a little bit, Maggie. Oh, yeah. Does someone else want to take this slide? I got to notice my is not stable. Yeah, so this was just, um, so a day to day hired for roles in cybersecurity. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty professional um, role there. So taking someone's characteristics and skills of attention to detail and focus uh, and putting them in a place for cybersecurity. So, um, Desjardins came back, so when this is a story that uh, we helped um, them work on, so that there was a couple successful factors for them in their uh, hiring process. So it was that they created that inclusive workplace and that we were able to help them with the recruitment and selection. Um, so to really help them with that on-the-job support and awareness training for the staff. So if we bring in an employee, um, help making sure that the other employees, other colleagues who will work with our, the RWA employee um, receive training and just kind of make sure that they are aware of how to interact with their new employee as well. Um, so this was a story um, from Metro Logistics. So uh, Jackie mentioned earlier that we were working with a few different logistics companies. Um, so this was a logistics and warehousing services to major retailers and consumer goods um, across North America. So it was a large, large um, logistics hub. Um, and then this was a kind of quote um, from the uh, manager there, is that we were able to kind of come in and really um, provide the right candidate for the warehouse environment. So being employer focused, we don't want to just put anyone forward for any job. We really want to get to the sense of what um, qualities you're looking for, what would make a successful employee in that role, and then make sure that we can find people who are interested, motivated, and um, want that job as well. So it's the right fit. And this uh, Mitchell Logistics is based in uh, the Mississauga area. So um, it's nice that this is um, something that's close to home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we've, we've featured um, the, all of these uh, that we've been talking about so far, we featured some RWA in action stories on our website. So definitely encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, what, what's great about the RWA in action RWA in action stories as well is that they're from the perspective of the employer. So it really gives you um, an understanding of, of how an employer um, found uh, working with Ready, Willing, and Able directly because of course the three of us know how wonderful <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. our initiative is. It sometimes is nice to hear from another um, colleague or an a, a, a employer as well, someone that would be in your shoes um, to hear about uh, what their experiences have been. Um, so definitely encourage everyone to take a look at that. They're uh, on our website again, some really fantastic, um, mm -hmm. some fantastic stories. And so this next one, Maggie, you worked on them if you want to yeah, okay. I'll definitely cover this one. If my internet is unstable again, someone else can <laughs> jump in. Um, so Airgate Technologies um, is a wonderful uh, employer. Um, they're a cloud infrastructure solutions provider working as a Microsoft partner. Um, they're a winner of the Impact Awards, Microsoft's Infrastructure Innovation Awards. Um, Nicole Mumford, who is the CEO, knows that companies that bring in workers with disability outperform their competitors, averaging 28% higher revenue. Um, and she puts an emphasis on character and initiative when um, looking for new talent and skills remain essential. So I know when she um, connected with us, she was interested in bringing on um, a, cloud, a cloud developer, and um, we brought her a few candidates to consider. Um, and again, I mean, this is also something I'm not sure we mentioned. I mean, um, when we bring candidates forward, it's also like they go through your recruitment process and we try to coach you on making it inclusive. But um, if you find that none of the candidates are fitting the skills and qualifications that you require to fill that role, there is no obligation to hire them at, at the end of the day. So we're not placing people in roles. Um, they are still competing for roles. So um, I just wanted to make that point. So anyway, um, so we brought candidates forward to her and she ended up really liking two of them um, out of the, I think, four or five that we brought forward. Um, and also a little side story about her interview. Um, instead of doing the very you know, traditional Q&A, 
tell me this, tell me that kind of stuff. Um, they just had a conversation and I think they ended up talking about Star Trek and all other sort of things that they had in, in common. And she was really just assessing whether they would be a good fit on the team. Um, I mean, I think they talked about technical stuff as well to make sure that he, they presented the skills uh, required to, to do the job. But I think, you know, they did a very casual uh, interview, um, which worked really well. And she ended up hiring two people, even though she only had um, one vacancy. And, um, and Siobhan, if you want to go to the next slide, it just shows you a picture of Airgate's entire team, which is, I don't know, I think they have around 11, 12. Yeah. Yeah, t 10, to, 10 to 15 folks on, on their entire team. It's a small company, and two of them um, are on the spectrum. And she also hired um, an admin person to do some, it was a contract administrative position just to do some sca um, scanning and data entry, because I think they had gotten behind on some stuff. And so they also hired somebody um, just to do some like, data entry for them to get them caught up on some administrative tasks. Um, so she had at that point when she first started working with us, she had hired three people um, that the, the data entry person, her contract ended. And so she she left the, that role. But the two the two guys are still there and they're thriving and um, they do a lot of speaking engagements together. But this is just shows that, you know, you don't have to have a huge DNI budget to, to hire inclusively. You can have a small team. And she and, and Nicole has said that customers will call her and and they ask for the autistic guy to work on whatever the issue is um, because they know he has such great attention to detail. Um, he's, he's very precise, he's to the point, and he gets the work done um, very efficiently and effectively. Yeah, and that's a, 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 a I, I love this example so much, and Airgate is such, such a truly fantastic employer, and, and really, um, I, I think it's important for us to note too that we we have worked with a number of really small employers. It's not just those big, large scale employers that we connect with and that we see success with. It's also smaller employers as well. I'm just even thinking now I, I've worked with a creative writing group. I think they have about three full-time employees and they ended up hiring someone uh, through Reading Willing and Able to become a, a team member and additionally to that they ended up hiring another person they created a job for someone to do editing of, um, of the, the, the creative writing that um, that their clients were putting forward because they were so impressed by the skill set that the individual possessed when they interviewed them that they created this whole editing uh, role for an individual. So, um, so really, yeah, we we find that that with employers, once you um, once you realize the the advantage of hiring inclusively and you um, you act act on that, um, it really does. Um, create um, just such a fantastic workplace, an innovative and, and um, excellent workplace. Yeah, and now I think now more than ever, right, it's important to make sure that you have the right employees at work to make sure things are running smoothly. So I think it's worth, you know, it's definitely worth the time to, um, worth the effort to put in the time to find that right employee for you and to maybe explore non-traditional avenues to make sure that you find that right fit. So, um, you know, whether they have a disability or not, that's what you want is the right person for the right job. Yeah. Um, so these are just some similar roles to kind of speak to um, more of um, the more professional specialized roles that we've worked with. So these are across Canada. And so some of these are large companies like Rogers, and then some of them are smaller companies who just needed one or two highly skilled people, found someone for that role, and then they've been there for the last few years. So I think, you know, to show that there's not high turnover, high retention, um, and when a company just needs one person to do the job, if you find someone, you know, with a disability um, and their skills kind of match, the right fit, and then off, off you go. So these are just some of the, some of the roles that we've supported in hiring over the past. Mm -hmm. So um, as well as what, you know, um, knowing that um, the pandemic has kind of affected us all, it's also kind of disproportionately affected people with disabilities. So we know that people with disabilities, um, so there was a Statistics Canada report that came out last month showing that 36% of people with disabilities um, experience a loss in their job uh, or reduction in hours. Um, youth with disabilities were disproportionately affected as well as um, those with disabilities with lower education levels, so or in more entry level roles. 
So we know that um, people with disabilities have lost work or um, already had a hard time finding work, and now with the pandemic, just presenting an additional barrier for them to employ um, to employment. So kind of taking the time to, as every business recovers and is slowly going through its phases of reopening, to make sure that it, to take the time to build inclusion into that recovery. So it doesn't need to be a separate project for when you're back and up and ready. It's really something that can help you grow your business and scale up as well, making and as well as helping the community. Um, so this is just kind of something to show that, you know, take the time right now to make sure that you have the right employees to help you move forward and your community and everyone benefits as well. So something else that we've seen um, with uh, the pandemic as well is how employers um, have had to very quickly provide accommodations to uh, to their existing employees. Um, so for example, remote work. Um, I'm currently <laughs> in my home as well as my two colleagues. Um, uh, just as an example of even accommodation in our workplace due to the to the pandemic and and employers um, all across Canada have have um, had to very very quickly um, put in place some of these new policies and procedures as a result and and I th and I think that we um, within the the disability community have really seen how 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 this. Uh, this itself is an accommodation and it really shows to other employers as well how it is possible to provide these accommodations and how it as well can um, can really have um, have a benefit to uh, diverse hires within an organization as well so um, so remote work is one thing that can be a really fantastic accommodation to an individual we've seen in the pandemic how uh, people can work effectively from home as part of a team with things like zoom um, microsoft teams a variety of different technologies um, so we really have seen this as being a um, as being a uh, a very fantastic opportunity for employers to realize how these types of innovations um, can can be a benefit to an employer um, but also can provide um, an accommodation to a person with a disability um, and these are things as well that we work with an employer as well we, we do want to to make it clear as well that everyone is unique so an accommodation that someone may require um, it, it, it is unique to an individual uh, but just something to keep in mind as well that that within your workplace I'm sure you've already provided such accommodations um, to people due to the pandemic um, it could even just be um, like if people have kids at home, if people are, are juggling different types of schedules as well as a result of the pandemic, um, that these are, are different things as well that can, um, that can allow you to be an inclusive workforce also. So how remote work can enhance inclusion accessibility. These are um, kind of a, like I was saying as well, um, that these, these types of things as well are, are also ways to increase inclusion and diversity within the workplace. So um, use of accessible technology, um, ongoing access to support staff, uh, allow for more quiet and controlled workplace, allow for meaningful breaks, um, and, and such things like that, that I think the Canadian workforce is seeing how easy it is to, to implement these um, and how it does result in, um, in many uh, benefits towards the productivity of a workplace. So um, just to, so, to highlight some benefits in partnering with um, Ready, Willing, and Able, and, and from hearing feedback from employers who have worked with us, it's giving them a competitive edge. Um, inclusion is better for business, which we've talked a lot about um, in this webinar today. Um, we've heard a lot about the impact it has on a team morale. Um, you know, I think that people like to support businesses that represent their, their community or their family. And I think everybody has a connection in some way or another to disability. So um, if their workplace is, is, is dedicated to supporting this population and being inclusive, I think it makes people feel um, you know, more dedicated to their work and feeling more included in, in the culture of the team. Um, there's an obvious return on investment. Um, we, we provide some marketing material that you can use if you wanted to promote that you're an inclusive employer because again there's a lot of 
you know, consumer loyalty benefits in, in promoting that. Um, this is a, this uh, image here is a web badge you could put on your website. Um, you get innovative perspectives from bringing on staff from a, a neurodiverse population. Uh, employer peer connections. Um, we offer a lot of free training and resources that we spoke about. Um, you know, we stay connected and offer you ongoing support as needed. Um, and it, you know, a lot of companies nowadays with with um, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, there's a lot of focus on diversity and inclusion and focusing on those underrepresented groups, um, which is including uh, people with disabilities. So a lot of companies are scrambling to implement a diversity and inclusion strategy, which I think is, is huge and important and a, a great way to, um, uh, to realize your DNI strategy is to partner with organizations such as Ready, Will, and Able and other organizations that represent the other underrepresented groups um, to help you in your awareness and your training and your recruitment efforts to, to really um, broaden your, your workforce and make sure it is, is diverse. I think also something we've heard is that even just showing, um, you know, having this web badge on your website, or it's, we can also have a physical window decal for physical locations, um, just to show that, you know, your existing employees too, they might have a connection to someone with a disability, or they might themselves have a disability that they weren't comfortable disclosing initially, but seeing that their workplace is inclusive and just kind of make sure that everyone feels comfortable being who they really are at work is uh, an important part as well. Oops. So these are some of the things that we kind of went over uh, a bit at the beginning, um, but these are some of the ways RWA can help um, by implementing promising practices for inclusive hiring. So starting from um, the clear and uh, inclusive job description. So making sure it's clear, up to date and results oriented. So what is the core of the job? What is the outcome that you're looking for? And so you can really identify the skills needed to achieve that. So you can look, so you will be able to find the people who can produce the results of the job. Um, this goes into pre-screening, like Maggie mentioned about scheduling phone calls, having alternative formats, you know, going for a chat, having a skills-based interview. So if it's a data entry role, do we really need to have a conversation with have excellent people skills or can you have more of a physical data entry um, assessment and actually show you that I can do the job? Um, this would go into onboarding. So maybe having an external job coach initially just to come and kind of make that gap or sorry, fill the gap and kind of help the transition into work and then taking that and building natural supports. So even the idea of some employers have a buddy system, you know, any new employee gets a mentor, gets a buddy to just help them around. So that would help any new employee in the job. So kind of destigmatizing that, you know, the job coach or that supports are needed on the job sometimes. And we could help you kind of show you, you know, identify maybe someone who wants to take a leadership role or kind of help you put those supports in place. And then transitioning that to training and education for the whole team. So this can be all different levels. So just um, other you know, entry level staff to the recruitment department, HR. Um, so really making sure everyone is aware of kind of, you know, uh, inclusive workplace practices. So our WA works. Um, we're super proud to, to offer a totally free online uh, resource hub. Um, so it is, I, I keep referring to our website, but it's on our website. Um, it, there are five uh, modules within our WA works uh, that go over various things related to, um, to inclusive hiring. This is something as well that a, a number of employers have used um, as kind of a, a jumping off point when um, when when wanting to show to their teams that they are uh, they prioritize uh, inclusion within the workplace so definitely encourage you to take a look at it again it's totally free and another great thing with it as well is if you're looking in that and you think oh I'm very interested in course number five you don't have to take all four in order to get to course number five you can take whatever you want. It's and um, yeah, we can also help you embed this into if you have any existing kind of HR downloads trainings yeah. for employees, you know, those health and safety kind of courses that everyone needs to take. Um, we can definitely help you embed this into some of those trainings as well so that any new employee just needs to learn about it, either inclusive and uh, in work environments and, you know, contributing to that uh, inclusive work uh, workforce as well. So we can definitely help 
with that. Yeah, a number of employers have done that and it, it's a really great um, thing to do as well to, to have it from day one. New employees that are on your coming into your team understand that diversity and inclusion and um, supporting individuals with disabilities to join the team is a priority for the business. Um, so that some of those barriers that we were talking about, those unintentional barriers of attitude and thinking that people can't do the job, it's a way to from day one of someone being a team member within your organization to dispel those myths and get around um, that, that kind of um, way of thinking. And then I think these are our Q&A. I'm not sure, I don't think we have any questions at the moment. Bridget, if you're able to see any, but I think. No um, questions at the moment, okay. but um, for, for, for uh, those logged on, Deborah, if you have any, any questions for us, I've given you permission to speak. So you feel free to just pop in with a question if you have any. Um, I wanted to take this time too to thank uh, Siobhan, Maggie, and Jackie for this wonderful presentation. I was in the background clapping on occasion <laughs> and like, yes. <laughs> uh, I think, I think your organization is doing such important work um, and, and I think um, you know your services in terms of employment support uh, are invaluable um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really really impressed with everything you're doing and, and I, I, I hope that our clients and community members um, you know click into this session. I will have the recording available on our website uh, and I am happy to connect anyone uh, and make a referral to uh, Ready, Willing and Able um, on request uh, as we'd love to connect you and, and, and get you the support that you need for your business. Um, so yes, yeah, so if there's no questions, uh, I will, I would, Oh, I will thank you. Uh, I see from Deborah. Uh, okay, so she had a little comment in the chat there. She said, thank you for this information. We also support folks with disabilities and interested in how others are doing this. Um, so yeah, I, I, as you said, you know, this is, this is uh, of the moment and, and thankfully, you know, that, that, that this, is, this has pushed us towards uh, a more inclusive, inclusive mindset, hopefully. Uh, and, I, and I hope that, uh, that people check you out and, um, you know, use your services because I think you're doing really great work. Um, so thank you again and thank you, Deborah, for joining us. And, and uh, we will share the recording and refer anyone who has any questions to you. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was great. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.